one go so good good evening everybody on behalf of endocrinology committee of obstetrics and gynecological society of South, southern india i welcome you all to this very interesting and uh, a very novel webinar that is understanding reproductive endocrinology which is going to be very useful not only just for the uh, beginners but also for the practicing um, uh, fertility specialist to just get an idea as to come back to the basic and understand the endocrinology so that they will be able to apply better in their clinical practice. So um, today we have lined up few interesting topics, uh, not only just for fertility, but also the other aspects like as in labor and also on, on sexual health. So um, uh, to start with, uh, I would uh, like to in invite our uh, uh, president of Oxy, Dr. Jairani Kamaraj to give the welcome address. So over to Jairani, madam. Anivirukum vanakkam. Thank you, Mala, for the uh, nice introduction on the Endocrinology Committee's work. Uh, respected Chief Guest, Dr. Sunita, Guest of Honor, Dr. Subhash, Senior Faculties, Dr. Uma, uh, Dr. Satya, Dr. Uh, Raki, and dear friends, Dr. Sunita, Dr. Uh, Shama, Dr. Richa, and my dear Secretary, Dr. Kundari, and all the senior logicians and dear delegates, it gives me a great pleasure and pride and honor to welcome you all for this endocrinology webinar, which we are having every month. It is second of its kind. And we have covering a lot of topics just to applicable for the basics, which is will be very useful for all the practitioners as well as the postgraduates to start everything from the basics. But, so Mala has made this a very nice uh, composite way to make a very interesting one. And I welcome all the senior people for this webinar. And I thank uh, uh, Shield also for giving this platform. I welcome the chief guests, the guests of honor, all the senior faculties and all the senior chairpersons and my dear friend committee, Oxy23 chair, I mean, uh, all the delegates as well as my friends. Over to you, Mala. So we'll move on to the Oxy prayer, Mala. Yeah, thank you, God. Um, in humility, we gather. In gratitude, we pray for all the good things you have given us. Shower us with your blessings to pass on the healing touch, to celebrate the arrival of each new life and mom reborn. The courage to deal with it all when they but keep our women safe and from free from sorrow. We bow before your kindness and the magnanimity of your endless love. Thank you. Mala, unmute, unmute, Mala. Yeah, yeah. So we Mala. seek the blessing of the Almighty and start the webinar today. So with an invocation song. <laughs> Play the presentation, Sahiti. Just a second. Okay, can I share that? Yes, ma'am.
So we have um, our uh, so today's uh, guest of honor is Dr. Subhash Malia. So it is a great uh, honor and a privilege to have uh, Dr. Subhash, the young and dynamic uh, person. In fact, uh, um, he's got a very primary post in uh, Foxy as an endoscopy uh, chairperson and uh, a very good endoscopic specialist and a good friend of many of us. He is also the um, practicing gynecologist in Baby and Memorial Hospital Calicut and the current secretary of Kerala chapter of IAG and managing council member of IAG as well. And apart from that, he has various other accolades to his credit. So may I uh, invite uh, Subhash Malia to give away the guest of honor address, please. Madam, thank you. Thank you very much, Mala Madam, for that. At the outset, let me thank Gerani Madam and the whole team of Oxy for this wonderful opportunity. Uh, I am not sure whether I am actually fit to be the guest of honor, but then um, I have the galaxy of so many seniors here. Sunita Madam is here, Kumaram, Raki Madam, Mala Madam, Jairani Madam, Kundar, the whole, whole team here. Again, I, I feel very happy and privileged to be a part of this. And I wish Jairani Madam and the whole team of Oxy, they have been doing a wonderful job. I just had an occasion to see last week Jairani Madam adopting a whole village and actually doing a, and, and, and taking care of all the facilities for all the ladies for the whole uh, year. I think it's a wonderful opportunity. It's a very good, it's not even a part of CSR. It's actually a part of the Oxy. It's a wonderful thing, you know, to have one of our own member societies doing such a wonderful job. Mala ma'am, I wish you the very best for the future and on, for all the accolades. And again, I thank, I, I wish you the way um, and congratulate you for the, for the IAG, uh, IAG coming conference and also for the IAG uh, election, which you had ma'am. Raki ma'am, thank you very much for the wonderful opportunity again. And Sunita madam, as I would like to say, ma'am, I would like to, Wish you the very best. I know, I know you have a, you have a lot of, uh, uh, lot of issues, a lot of things going ahead of you. And I wish the very best. And you come out in flying colors, ma'am. My best wishes to you, ma'am. Actually, I'm a speaker on the other side, ma'am. So I would just uh, like to go to the other side and come back. Huh? You're waiting for my talk. I'm sorry for that. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you. Thanks. Thank, thank you. Thank I'll, thank just you join, I'll, I'll just join you back. I'll just join you back, ma'am. I'll just join you back. Yeah, huh? yeah. Thank you. Thanks, ma'am. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Subhash. So now we come to the uh, the main key person of the day, our chief guest, Dr. Sunita Tandilwakar, Madam. So Madam does not require any introduction. And in fact, she is one of the best, in fact, gynecologists in entire India. As everyone knows, she's done a phenomenal work in uh, for Foxy. And of course, she is going to, I'm sure for, for sure, she's going to be the uh, winner in this upcoming election. And also, I'd like to seek all your blessings and favor our uh, Dr. Sunita Tandilwaka, Madam, in this upcoming election. So, uh, Madam, in fact, uh, the, uh, as you all know, has got various accolades and academic achievements uh, to her uh, credit. And she is a excel, not only an excellent endoscopic surgeon, but also a great obstetrician and infertility specialist. You can see all her accolades in the CV. So, we would request Sunita, Madam, to deliver her uh, ch um, uh, chief guest address, please. Thank you. Thank you, dear, so much, Jairani. I'm so, so humbled. Uh, Oxy is a very honorable platform. To come on this platform as a chief guest, I'm really feel humbled, honored. And uh, uh, when I went through the scientific program, I really loved the way entire four lectures, I, if I don't uh, mistake, from the sexual medicine to reproductive medicine to infertility, ovulation to parturition, I'm sure Mala, Raki, Uma and you yourself will be doing a great job for this. The academics of Oxy is always above all. I really love. But at the same time, when you have taken over as a president, I'm observing your activities. You are doing so much phenomenal out of the world ideas and social activities. Just now, Subhash Malia said about the village, even I saw that in one of the WhatsApp group and I felt, oh, when I was a president, I did not stuck to me, you know. So you are going for a committee chairperson and I'm sure you will be the great asset for three years to Foxy and looking forward to become a VP also one day because these talent, these creative ideas, uh, you know, knowledge with creativity always gives 
so much more to the foxy organization which is one of the biggest organization even with rakhi i must say endocrinology committee when i i i think i would not have done so much justice what rakhi is doing the amount of her dialogue activities the endocrinology mein teen saal webinars what a topic she is creating in that gynecological field is amazing and the endocrinology probably the subject of a little fear for a common gynecologist has become a confident uh, you know the way they manage i don't think any one of us refer our thyroid patients to the thy- consultant we manage ourselves our thyroid problems we manage many of the endocrinological problem and only because these webinars helps us to come out on a recent updates just by sitting with you all for 2 hours thank you for giving me an opportunity i just want to ask you jairani tumhare piche jo flowers hai are they real flowers <laughs> uh sunita ma'am yes no 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 they are just... so beautiful so beautiful no, no, they are not real ma'am they are not real <laughs> <laughs> i just love those fall flowers they make yeah. you feel so positive around there yeah so thank, thank you, you so much and mala the dynamic lady we have i have seen her in iig in 5 years the yeah. way she come up it's only because of her talent <laughs> thank you that we gave the platform for her to perform but ultimately she won the hearts of people by her endoscopic surgery skill and more i came closer to mala i realized mala is not young she is in two decades into endoscopy and she has started from a scratch and she has created her own space in this world and i am really proud of you mala thank, <laughs> thank you so much yeah thank, thank you. you for having me and i wish you all the best for the cme <laughs> thank you thank you so much sunita madam your words mean so much to us ma'am in fact i still remember when i first met you in the uh, endoscopy conference and we was in totally inspired and awe by all your uh, the academic activities and the way you were operating and your dynamic leadership that is what was really you know had really taken so much of uh, Uh, attraction towards the endoscopy madam i am sure like uh, uh, at, at least to some extent we all uh, are trying to uh, reach to you all <laughs> this thing ma'am so uh, uh, yeah madam uh, we wish you all the very best and we are with you in the upcoming election and we wish to see you in f- flying colors madam there is absolutely thank no thank you so much <laughs> thank you so much openly yeah. showing on a open platform uh, jairani malaraj your secretary kundan kundvi madam i really appreciate you openly supporting i really and i am humbled and i'm promising you i'll be standing strong with you all thank you thank you thank you thank you yeah so we move on to the um, academic session so may i invite our uh, chairpersons dr sunita garwal uh dr uh, mahisa bellino dr shyama a uh, devadasan and dr richa gupta so dr uh, sunita agarwal is a hod and senior consultant at uh, sunita hospital she has almost 15 years of experience in colposcopy and uh, she is the current president of uh, aogs and also the member of the foxy mtp committee and uh, she has various uh, awards and publications her main field of interest is infertility and cervical cancer and also preventive preventive oncology so over to you madam to introduce our first speaker uh, dr rakhi singh dr sunita garwal oh she has let my cv and the slides together one more yeah yeah okay so uh, yeah so uh, can we have the previous uh, slide dr rakhi Hello? singh yeah dr rakhi singh's uh, cv so may uh, i think i will introduce the chairperson so that uh, they can introduce uh, the speaker as and when they are uh, yes hello good evening can you hear me uh, hello yes madam yes madam we can hear you 
but i can't see your uh, cd on screen okay so see which you but my जी कमिटी फॉक्सी वाइस चेयरपर्सन ऑफ यूपी स्टेट ऑफ इस पीयर रिव्यू ऑफ जर्नल ऑफ स्टेटिक एंड गायनिकोलॉजी ऑफ इंडिया जोगी awards and there are so many awards achievement and publish uh, publication invited faculty for 350 national international conferences foxy dc datta award for publication hepatitis b in women foxy cs don award at 65 aicog first prize written chapters in books foxy focus and jaipur gynecology thank you I was most humbled by listening to all the members of OGHS and uh, Jai Rani being the president, uh, Dr. Kundvi, who is uh, the secretary, and Mala. Thank you for inviting me, and the chief guest, Dr. Sunita Madam, who is a lovely personality altogether, and uh, whom we love to hear her, and we would like her to see her at a. bigger stature and uh, my topic which is given to me is a little dry but uh, let's see how interesting we can make by this is the endocrinology of ovulation and the clinical implication what it has and if the ovulation only doesn't occurs then how will we have the pregnancies and how are we going to move forward and the menstrual cycle itself also gets hampered if the ovulation doesn't occurs which we all understand and uh, we just have an uh, overview of it that uh, the organs which are involved uh, would be like the uh, anterior hypothalamus the anterior pituitary ovaries and the uh, uterus are the four main organs which come into play right right from beginning and uh, the major players which of the hormones which come into play would be the gnrh hormone the fsh lh estrogen and the progesterone these all are the hormones which help in the formation of ovulation and the oocyte which is to be released there is a uh, some, uh, some amount of fine tuning with the inhibin active and the growth hormone which does for the ovulation to occur how do these hormones interact with each other basically the gonadotropin releasing hormone released is released from the hypothalamus and acts on the pituitary whereas the fsh and the lh released by the anterior pituitary acts on the ovary and the estrogen and the progesterone is produced by the growth growing follicle and acts on the endometrium and this in turn gives a negative feedback or the positive feedback for the hypothalamus how it has to act and the gnrh hormones when we talk about it it is a decapeptide pulsatile in fashion and the pulse frequency of gnrh is around 60 to 90 per minute and uh, it is there in the uh, once it is released it's there for 2 to 4 hours and the longer half life would be around 8 to 12 hours and pre ovulatory surge is seen with these uh, gnrh and clinically when we talk about it is gnrh are used as an agonist and as an antagonist cycles in ivf what we know very well of to suppress the ovulatory cycles ovulation and then hormones are given from outside so that we have a good uh, multi follicular development instead of a mono follicular development in the ov for us the, of the oocytes coming about let's talk about the fsh FSH is released by the gonadotrophs of the anterior pituitary and large quantities are released during menstrual cycle itself it is it helps in the growth of the anterior follicle the granulosa cell proliferation and differentiation occurs because of FSH estrogen project production is helped because of it the induction of the LH receptors on the theca cells the inhibin synthesis 
and the important role in selection of the dominant follicle is by the FSH. And there is an FSH threshold which happens and because of which the dominant follicle comes up and thereafter the rest of the antral follicles, they plateau go. A word about the LH, it is secreted by the gonadotrophs relatively quiet during the early and the mid follicular phase, late follicular phase, which sees the LH surge and it triggers the ovulation for the follicular rupture. Disruption of the oocyte cumulus complex occurs, induces the resumption of the oocyte maturation and utilization of the granulosa cells. LH surge is due to the pre-ovulatory surge in the gonadotrophin secretion, increased gonadotrophin receptors on gonadotrophs that per preferentially secrete LH. Small rise in the progesterone may also have a role to play for the LH, a luteal phase, the pulse frequency drops two to four hours later. The HCG hormone also mimics inaction to LH and that is why we use HCG hormone for the ovulation trigger whenever we are monitoring and stimulating a cycle. A word about the estrogen, it is a synthesized by the granulosa cell and acts as a cog in a negative feedback mechanism and triggers LH surge after re reaching a critical level development of the endometrium. And the synthesis for the progesterone, it is synthesized by the granulosa cells and secretory changes in the endometrium are seen. Expression of the gene needed for the implantation at the level of the endometrium is because of the progesterone hormone and suppression of the gonadotrophin release also is because of the progesterone hormone. And uh, just a word about the ovarian morphology, which is very dynamic organ in itself, a hormone in itself, or hormone producing organ. And it has around 4 lakh, uh, four lakh oocytes at Minar, and somewhere around 1,500 are only left by the time the patient reaches, the woman reaches her menopausal state. Primordial to the antral stage of their development is seen in this uh, ovary. And as it is the pool of the oocytes uh, which the patient is born with and it slowly decreases by the time she reaches the uh, menopausal age and initial recruitment of the oocytes occurs right Somewhere around 21, from day 21 onwards of the previous cycle, only 21 to 25 days only, the recruitment of the oocytes start beginning for the very next cycle. Whereas we start seeing it from the day two of the cycle, but the recruitment of the antral follicle starts way before the uh, menstrual cycle only. Mm -hmm. And once it is antral follicle is seen, thereafter it grows. And we do the follicular monitoring to see for the ovulation which has occurred or not. If the ovulation has not occurred, that, then that uh, follicle it raises and corpus luteum doesn't form. Mm -hmm. The gonadotrophins act only after the stage of the antral follicle. Any drug given to improve the quality should be given for at least, sorry for the spell check, three months before its effect can be seen. Fine tuning, there is, uh, the ovary is an endocrine, paracrine and the autocrine gland of the body. And as it is the, from the hypothalamus to the pituitary to the ovary, the activin and the folistatin and the inhibin hormone plays a role over the GnRH to produce uh, uh, hormones through the pituitary. Thereafter, from the pituitary to the ovary, the LH and the FSH are produced because of the stimulation by the inhibin, folistatin, and the active in hormones. The inhibin hormone secreted by the granulosa cells, inhibin A and inhibin B are the dimers. Inhibin B starts rising in the early follicular phase and negatively influences the FSH secretions. The active in and the folistatin, the active in is a promoter of the FSH secretion Inhibin and the androgen production. Polystatin is active binding protein and controls the bioactivity of the active. 
normally we don't check for the inhibin hormone nowadays uh, we, earlier we used to do way back but we have stopped doing the inhibin activin all these hormones for the ovulation check the growth factors also play a major role there are various growth factors the intra ovarian actions it takes igf1 to tnf tgf alpha tgf beta hormone evaluation for the ovulations what all hormones we require to know whether the correct ovulation is going to happen or not we do measure on day 2 of the cycle the fsh and the lh and the estradiol hormones to know a good correct uh, ovulation which is going to happen or not and the progesterone is measured thereafter any day of the cycle the amh and uh, tsh is measured prolactin is checked to if the prolactin and the thyroid hormones are correct in place then definitely the ovulation would be in place and day 21 progesterone hormone is checked if the progesterone hormone is above the threshold of 36 then we know that positively the patient has ovulated that cycle a word about the thyroid dysfunction and the ovulation if the thyroid hormone is uh if the patient is having hypo or hyperthyroidism then the menstrual cycle definitely gets affected and if the menstrual cycle is affected then there would be impaired function of the uh, ovarian quality and the sperm quality and also the ovulation would be affected lowering the levels of the estrogen and the progesterone making it difficult to fertilize the embryos and successfully implantation of the embryos leading to anovulatory cycles the prolactin hormone also has an effect because if the prolactin is high definitely the hypothyroidism is also seen apart from that this also behaves and uh, leaves an ovulation because of the prolactin hormone being increased the gnrh pulse frequency decreases and thereafter from the pituitary again the lh and the fsh hormone also decreases thereafter causing increased prolactin hormone and galactoria or the anovulation any part of it would be seen normally the in a ovulatory cycle menstrual cycle there is only a single oocyte which develops and only single oocyte development occurs and during the fsh secretion limited by the negative feedback from the estrogen production by the large follicle and similar follicles with fewer fsh receptors and no longer stimulates the growth of by decreasing fsh level and undergoes the rest of the follicles undergo atresia therefore a single follicle reaches the maturation stage as it is we've understood till now and let's compare the normal follicular genesis with the uh, comparison vis a vis the follicular genesis in the pcod patients the polycystic ovarian disease patients here the primordial follicle from the primary it develops the recruitment occurs and a good growth is seen thereafter the accelerated growth is has to happen whereas because of the fsh in normally it increases during the implantation during the anterior follicle count phase during the fo early follicular phase the fsh should increase and the amh should decrease for the follicular growth whereas in uh, uh, pcos patient the fsh falls down and the amh also increases that's why you have a high amh for these Uh, PCOD PCOD patients and the LH hormone and the insulin hormone is normal in uh, whereas in the uh, normal cycle where vis a vis when we talk about the PCOD patient the LH hormone increases and there are multiple small follicles which are seen as a pearl string and none of them grow to the that level because the LH hormone which is raised and that doesn't allow the normal follicular genesis to occur and follicular arrest occurs at that stage and anovulation in pcos patient is a supraphysiological synthesis of estrogen is seen strong negative feedback signals to the hypothalamus and pituitary is given low gnrh production with positive feedback on lh occurs and low fsh and high lh and no ovulation is seen on or, or anovulation is seen in pcod patients and if suppose the patient is not having pcod per se only having androgen excess then the elevated androgen levels impair the hypothalamus sensitivity to the progesterone suppression 
of GnRH pulse frequency and okay. contributes to the abnormal GnRH and the gonadotropin hormone sec secretions, impairs the follicular development and increases the ovarian estrogen production, initiate vicious, vicious cycle of hyperandrogenemia and neuroendocrine okay. abnormalities occurs and hypoandrogenism occurs and because of which again the patient may have prolonged amenorrhea or anovulatory cycles. A word about the ovarian reserve testing and providing the indirect measures of the cohort of the recruitable antral follicle present in the FSH window at the beginning of each menstrual cycle. The functions of the ovarian reserve, ideally the gonadotropin response is checked during the day two, day three of the cycle and because of which the early FSH works are in the early phase of the antral phase of the cycle and thereafter the preovulatory it grows only the single follicle is seen growing. As we all know as the age advances there is a decline in the fertility and the fixed ovarian pool becomes depleted as the time increases. So the anovulation rate is more. The less number of the oocornea and the decline in the oocyte quality is seen. Poor implantation and increased chance of miscarriages are seen because of the higher age group and the higher chances of genetic aberrations are seen because of a higher age group because the oocyte quality is hampered and the ovulation is again hampered. Just an uh, just a word about the interpretation, final interpretation of the FSH hormone. The follicular stimulating hormone is one of the most important hormones. It is a main hormone involved in producing and maturing in the eggs in the ovaries. In menopause, most more FSH is released from the pituitary in an attempt to stimulate the ovaries to produce a good follicular genesis and the estrogen hormone is produced well and have a good monofollicular uh, oocyte, whereas the ovulation is not that frequent in elderly patients. Whereas in the luteal phase, when we correlate, good corpus luteum will tell us that there is a good response and a good support for this uh, patient. And uh, if the progesterone hormone mm -hmm. is more than 25, then we know that there is a good quality of the oocyte which is secreted and she's got a positive chance for a conception. There is also a, a role of premature LH surge. The premature LH surge can be defined as a premature rise of LH accompanied by the concomitant rise in progesterone may interfere with the timing of the IUI or the results in the cancellation more if the treatment occurs and if the premature LH surge occurs then again the progesterone hormone also differs and there would be not much amount of the progesterone hormone which is produced on the day 21 or seven days post ovulation and the ovulation is also hampered over there. Mm -hmm. To conclude FSH uh, hormone is high in the early recruited follicles during that phase, the antral follicle count, we can see because of the FSH and FSH can be correlated with the age. LH hormone, the antral follicle count, it affects on that. If the LH is more, then number of antral follicle counts increases. The stromal vascularity and the endometrium prior, prior to ovulation is more during that time when the LH surge is about to happen. AMH, we can correlate along with AFC and the age of the patient. Estradiol, the, we can correlate with good vascularity of the follicle and the endometrium and the good cervical mucosa. Progesterone, there is a residual corpus luteal and the thick endometrium on day 21 or the corpus luteum will have a good vascularity. We know that the progesterone hormone is good. Thyroid, if the hormone is within the normal range, it has a good follicular genesis. Prolactin, Again, if it is within normal range, then the good follicular genesis and no residual cysts are seen on day two. If the patient is repeatedly having residual cysts on the day two of the cycle scan, we know that the pro probably the prolactin is a, is a culprit for it. The key point is to understand the basics of the ovulation is stepping stone towards a fertility management, get our basics rights and improve the productive potential 
for our patients. Thank you all. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Raki Singh. That was a very, very nice, lucid presentation and a wonderful recap of the basics of uh, ovulation. I think we have a query here. One Dr. Ananta Lakshmi has asked, uh, a high serum estradiol seen during stimulation, why it is not causing ovulation? In IVF cycles, we suppress with GnRH antagonist. Mm -hmm. But in IUI cycles, even we get two to three follicles and high serum estradiol is not triggering ovulation. Yeah, high serum estradiol definitely doesn't cause a good... Uh follicle because the estrogen hormone is high and it is giving a negative feedback to the hypothalamus and the pituitary. So the LH and the FSH is at fault because of the high estrogen. As it is, I had shared that slide of it. The estrogen gives us negative feedback to the GnRH and because of which, again, that whole cycle is affected. So the estradiol hormone, what we normally target and keep it, it should be below 50. That gives a better chances. But nowadays, people are stimulating with above. Uh, there are studies which are uh, quoting that it should be below 75 or 100. But uh, 50 below estradiol hormone on day two gives a better result for ovulation and uh, recruited follicles. Number of recruited follicles and the number of follicles for the IVF are better. So I, I want to add up one more thing, Raki. Yeah. It's yeah. because of the estradiol which is raised, there is a negative feedback on the uh, pituitary which reduces the LH. The LH yeah. is the one which is needed for the for the meiotic division. The diplotene stage of the oocytes will get into the uh, yes. I mean, meiotic stages. It goes for the maturation only by the LH surge. The mm -hmm. LH is needed for the maturation of the oocytes, which will not happen if the estradiol is very high. So that is why even with a good oocyte two or three, if you have more estradiol, you may not have good ovulation and good quality oocytes, which is not happening because of the uh, I mean, negative feedback which it has. That's why it should yeah. be a little lower. Mm, yeah. Yes, madam. That is very, very clear. In that fact, was very well presented in that slide which I had shown with that negative feedback, it was there in that slide. So, for ovulation, LH is the LH surge is the key, not the estradiol. The more the estradiol, less the LH surge, and ovulation doesn't occur. Yeah. That, to my knowledge, that is what I could infer. Okay, so now I think uh, if there are any other questions, we will take. There is one more, I think. What is the value of estradiol to set a positive feedback? That's what I said. Now, the value of estradiol on day two should be below 50. That is a cutoff normally taken for the IUI and the IVF. Normally, in the IUI cycles, we don't do uh, E2 levels, which is uh, uh, nowadays it is out. So in the IVF cycle, that times the estradiol is measured on the day two of the cycle to have a good uh, positive response. Yeah. So someone has asked, what is the number of, how many dominant follicles can a woman have in her lifetime? Normally one dominant follicle is there and mm -hmm. uh, in one cycle, otherwise humans would have had twins like uh, quadruplets, like all the other mammals. But humans have only one child at a time. So, the one dominant follicle comes up and the rest of them become metrical. In a lifetime, how many they can, they can have? How many times they will ovulate? There is some number in that, no? 450. 100, 450 uh, to uh, 100, yeah. they say. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, right, fine. So, that was a very good one. <laughs> Dr. Raki, thank you so much for a very, very comprehensive presentation. It was a wonderful recap of the entire basics of our, uh, ovulation. Of course, the brain is the bandmaster and the ovary is a very dynamic organ. And you have very clearly explained how the ovary loses its function, uh, you know, in due course of time after its uh, tremendous job of ovulation. So we move on to the next topic. And again, we have a very nice and excellent speaker, Dr. Umara, for which I would like to uh, invite our chairperson. So may I have our, uh, yeah. So Dr. I think Hazino Bello is, uh, is madam there? 
Okay, so I got a message that her sister is unwell and she had to attend to her. So um, uh, can I have Dr. Ah, yeah, Dr. Shama Devadasan is there. So we can ask Dr. Shama Devadasan to introduce Dr. Umara. Uh, Dr. Shama Devadasan is a chief consultant in fetal medicine in Trishu. And she is also the visiting consultant at Apollo Adlex Hospital uh, in Trivandrum and the Fetal Medicine Foundation. She is the UK certified um, anomaly scan uh, uh, specialist and also she has various other uh, credits to her and she's currently the secretary of Trishur Ops and Gynec Society and also master trainer for DIRA and executive committee member of perinatology and also the Kerala chapter of S SFM and member of the Society of Fetal Medicine. So over to Madam to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Umar Ram. So uh, can we have Dr. Umar Ram's uh, CV? Yes. CV, please. A very good evening to all. First of all, I would like to thank uh, the uh, society for actually inviting me over to chair a session. And uh, now I am to introduce <laughs> our dearest Umara Madam. Uh, I, I think I am too uh, very much obliged and very happy to be introducing her. We all know her from our, even myself from my PG days. I am sure that all of us are well versed with who she is, what she is. But well, uh, the um, official it, uh, things have to go on. So Madam is the director and consultant of Sita Pati Clinic and Hospital at Chennai. She's currently the chairperson of the South Zone of the RCOG chapter. And uh, yes, uh, she's the treasurer of the RCOG and the faculty, she's a faculty at the Maternal Medicine at uh, Gynec Academy. And definitely she, we will be seeing her now uh, at the Labor Congress that is at uh, the uh, Angamali, which is to be happening in Kerala. We are waiting for you, Madam, just after your session now here. Thank you. So over to Madam. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Shama, and uh, thank you, Mala and uh, Jadani, for this uh, invitation and for being a phenomenally dynamic uh, Oxy uh, team, I think, uh, leading and involving everybody uh, in events. So thank you very much. It's always good to accept a topic that you haven't really spoken about in a while because you get to read and then <laughs> you get to reiterate what you have learned. So um, I hesitated for a minute when uh, Mala said, will you talk about physiology of parturition? But uh, I'm glad I went through the exercise. So thanks again for the opportunity. Now, um, we all know that uh, labor is a physiological process and it involves a set of changes <clears throat> within the myometrium, the decidua and the cervix, which occurs gradually over a period of time, resulting in the expulsion of the baby really. Um, and this um, begins with some biochemical changes in the cervix, which then lead on to uterine contractions which result in cervical dilatation and then rupture of membrane. So this is the sequence and this is a sequence that is worth remembering when we are considering induction of labor because we need to make sure that the initial changes that happen in the cervix are in place um, before we can use medication which would induce uterine contractions or potentially cause rupture of membranes. So the mechanism of labor at term usually uh, is a process by which, uh, so if we, uh, if we look at the process of a pregnancy or the duration of pregnancy, basically this organ, which is being stretched by the growing fetus um, is kept quiet by a bunch of hormonal changes that happen. And the loss of this quiescence is what initiates labor. So it's not an active initiation of labor. It is more a withdrawal of the inhibitory effects, which reduce the quiescence of the uterus resulting in labor. In contrast, when somebody goes into preterm labor, 
there is something which overcomes this inhibitory effect of quiescence and induces an active contraction resulting in premature labor. So what, what uh, you know, various things can overwhelm the mechanisms that maintain quiescence, infection and hemorrhage are a couple of those uh, possible causes which then um, initiate labor. So there's a fundamental difference in the way in which spontaneous preterm labor differs from spontaneous term labor. So there is this cascade of events that result in the delivery of a baby. And this is called the parturition cascade. And uh, as I said, it begins with the removal of mechanisms which maintain the uterine quiescence. And then there is a recruitment of multiple factors which function sequentially, giving positive feedback. And this sequential changes induces uterine activity resulting in cervical dilatation. Now, anytime you have multiple factors which are acting, there are <clears throat> uh, feedback mechanisms. And these feedback mechanisms are in place essentially to ensure that there are fail-safe mechanisms which prevent complications. So there are different phases of uterine activity. Phase zero is an activity uh, where there is actually uh, inhibition. And then there is phase one where there is activation, which then moves on to phase two, which is actually when you have the uh, first and second stage of labor. And then phase three, when there is uh, stage three, as well as involution of the uterus. So the stage zero or quiescence happens during pregnancy. And this um, quiescence happens because of an increase in the production of prostacyclin, which then causes uterine relaxation and nitric oxide, which also causes uh, the relaxation. And all these other uh, substances which I have listed there, relaxin, progesterone, all of those also contribute to this phase of quiescence. From the phase of quiescence, as we reach term, at some point, there is myometrial activation and we enter into phase one. And this is linked with a functional withdrawal of progesterone at the level of the uterus. We will see later that there isn't actually a reduction or a drop in the level of progesterone. It is, a, it is a, what is termed as a functional withdrawal. And this functional withdrawal switches uh, the uterus from one of quiescent to one of an active mode, resulting in an increase in excitability and responsiveness to stimulators. And how does this increase in excitability and responsiveness happen? <clears throat> it happens because of increased expression of the contraction associated protein or CAP. There is an increase in connection 43. There are increase in gap junctions and there is also an increase in G protein coupled receptors, the oxytocin receptors and an increase in the you know, prostaglandin F receptors. So all of these are happening in the phase one in order to initiate contractions or activation which happens in phase two, which is the phase of stimulation, where there is an increased synthesis of uterotonic agonists, that is the prostaglandin as well as oxytocin. And this then results in the first two stages of labor, which is what we see clinically. So to reach this point, there is already two phases of events that are happening in the background. And often this is when women uh, may notice some changes, they may notice some, uh, you know, uh, what we what we would call pre-labor changes that are happening. And then finally, you have phase three, which is the phase of uterine involution, which is primarily mediated by the release of oxytocin. And uh, the uterus involutes back to size uh, in, a, in the days and weeks following delivery. So if we just think about it, it's a phenomenally beautifully orchestrated event ensuring that there is safe passage of new life into the world. So if you look at uterine activity during pregnancy, to summarize, you can have the inhibitors, which are the progesterone, prostacyclin, uh, relaxin, nitric oxide, and parathormone-related peptides, CRH and HPL, which are functional in quiescence. 
And then you have the eutrotropins, which are driven by some of the hormones like estrogen, progesterone, and prostaglandins and CRH and during the activation phase. And then the eutrotonics, which is what we use as medication to induce labor, that is prostaglandin and oxytocin come into phase. And then at the end of the stimulation phase, you have the birth of the baby, and then oxytocin continues to be produced, resulting in the involution. So this is the uh, phase of uterine activity uh, during the process of pregnancy and labor. Mm. So there is a dynamic biochemical dialogue that happens between the baby and the uteroplacental unit and the mom and the baby or the fetus to, uh, to a large extent actively works or contributes to this initiation of the process of labor. And from the maternal side, you have hormones, peptides and proteins which come into play. <clears throat> and now moving on to the actual stimulants, you have prostaglandins, which has a central role in the initiation of human labor. And uh, this uh, increase in the synthesis of both PGE2 and F2 alpha happens from the decidua and the fetal membrane. <clears throat> so what is the evidence that prostaglandins actually have a role? The fact that uterine tissue is selectively enriched with prostaglandin. We know that prostaglandin concentrations increase in the uterine tissue as well as amniotic fluid before the onset of labor. We also know that prostaglandins can initiate labor at any gestational age, which is why we are able to use it for termination of pregnancy, even in the preterm labor. And we know that inhibitors of prostaglandin, such as indomethacin, have been used to arrest labor and even as tocolytics. Prostaglandins are, can cause synchronous uterine contractions. They are known to cause cervical ripening. And then they also increase the myometrial sensitivity to oxytocin. So they have this all-encompassing role and a very central role uh, in uh, labor. <clears throat> On the other hand, the second uh, parallel to uh, what the prostaglandins do uh, to initiate labor, there is a withdrawal of the fetal paracrine support resulting to decidual activation. And this decidual activation is also followed by prostaglandin release. And that prostaglandin release results in uterine contractility. So E2 plays a more important role in cervical ripening whereas F2 alpha in uterine contractility, which is why E2 is used as a vaginal gel or as a sustained release gel or as a tablet to first ensure that there is cervical uh, effacement and ripening, as, which is the term that we commonly use, following which we use the F2 alpha in case F2 alpha uh, we use as medication when we're doing second trimester terminations for anomaly or an IUFD. But otherwise, we would use oxytocin um, following the cervical type. <clears throat> so that is the uh, clinical correlation to what is happening at a physiological level. Now, what about progesterone? Progesterone uh, works to reduce gap junctions, reduces oxytocin receptors, reduces the prostaglandin uh, levels, and also increases the rest and membrane potential. The sources of progesterone is ovarian progesterone up to seven weeks, after which the placental progesterone takes over. <clears throat> now, I said right at the start that you have a functional reduction in progesterone levels. You don't actually have a systemic reduction in the progesterone level if you measure it and the, the withdrawal of progesterone systemically is not a prerequisite for labor in humans um, which is why you can actually induce labor without giving an anti-progesterone at term or at any other gestational age. So you do not need to have systemic progesterone withdrawal which is necessary in other uh, you know, uh, farm animals, etc., but it's not a prerequisite for human labor. Estrogens also have a role to play because they increase gap junctions and they increase oxytocin receptor, and their function is probably by a paracrine action. The other strong stimulant, of course, is oxytocin, which is synthesized 
in the hypothalamus secreted by the posterior pituitary in a pulsatile manner has a half-life of three to four minutes. It's inactivated by the kidney and the liver and by the placental oxytocinase. Now, oxytocin is a very potent eutrotonic and uh, it actually, we know that we use exogenous oxytocin and sometimes we have to remind ourselves constantly that oxytocin is a drug uh, because we're also familiar with its use uh, in augmentation of labor. And oxytocin analogs can act as competitive antagonists uh, to endogenous oxytocin inhibiting contractions and therefore acting as a tocolytic, which also we know from uh, the drugs that we use for tocolysis. Now, the dual role of oxytocin is that it directly and indirectly can work. Directly, as I said, it mediates um, it, both the receptor and voltage-mediated calcium channels to affect the intracellular pathways to promote uterine contractions. Indirectly, it can stimulate prostaglandin production, both in the amniotic um, membrane as well as in the decidua. Now, the calculated oxytocin secretion rate from the fetoplacental unit increases from 1 milliunit per minute prior to labor to 3 milliunits per minute once labor is established. And um, so this, there is an increase in this oxytocin secretion. The other substance which has a role to play are cytokines, which are all uh, inflammatory uh, substances. So we know that macrophages exert an anti-inflammatory function and these promote uterine quiescence until term and pro-inflammatory in labor. Now, the increased inflammatory response uh, promotes uterine contractility by direct activation of contractile genes like the COX-2 oxytocin receptor connection, et cetera, and by impairing the capacity of progesterone to mediate uterine quiescence. So this is how cytokines come to work in labor. Now, um, the fetus is also known, um, and we have all for a long time uh, researched the idea that, that there is a fetal contribution to the initiation of labor. And this is very true in sheep and other models. Uh, and uh, the way it happens is it contributes to uterine stretch. There is a fetal endocrine cascade and there is believed to be some role of the surfactant and the platelet activating factor. And some evidence comes uh, for this from the fact that certain fetal anomalies, especially like anencephaly, uh, are known to cause a delay in parturition. So how does the fetal uh, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis uh, play a role? It plays a role through uh, the CRH secretion which is increased by glucocorticoids, the cytokines, acetylcholine, and oxytocin, whereas progesterone and nitric oxide reduce the CRS secretion. So this is a, 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 a figure just to show that there is a complex interplay between the fetus, the placenta, and the mother involving the hypothalamus, the anterior pituitary of the fetus, resulting in the production of CRH, which then releases cortisol, uh, which then acts on the placenta. And parallelly on the mother, you have the posterior pituitary releasing oxytocin, which then works on the uterus to initiate labor. So there is this complex interplay across these three organs, the fetus, the placenta, and the mother. Now, there's also this event of rupture of membranes, which happens in the process of labor. So membranes... You know, it's a miracle that the, such a thin membrane is able to stay intact. And we have seen in a lot of situations where the os may be open and still pregnancy continues for many weeks, sometimes without rupture of membranes. So membranes are derived from collagens, laminin, and fibronectin. And this matrix metalloproteases are the enzymes which reduce the membrane strength and increase collagen degradation. So the tissue inhibitors of these uh, MMPs or the matrix metalloproteases are the ones that maintain the integrity of the membrane. So that has to be lost for the membranes to rupture. So what are these MMP activating factors? You can have TNF alpha, interleukin, PGE2, and F2 alpha, all of which increase collagenase activity and they activate the inflammatory pathway in the membranes. 
Relaxin induces MMP3 and 9 and antagonizes the suppressive effect of progesterone and estrogen. And stretching of the PT membranes activates MMP1 and MMP3, resulting in peripartial destabilization, which is why uh, stripping of membranes also helps sometimes in initiating labor. The other factors are fluoxetine and peptides like CRH and urocortin also work. There are certain myometrial factors such as the GTP binding proteins, which play a pivotal role in myometrial contractility. And this, they work by coupling cell membrane receptors to the effector membranes and the calcium or the ion channels. And this results in an increase in intracellular calcium, facilitating myometrial contractions. So as you can see, there are multiple factors that are responsible for labor. Initiation, uh, maternal, fetal, placental, and decidual, and this interaction is fairly complex. Traditionally, there was the understanding of the placental clock, which was largely to do with the um, uh, axis of uh, steroids and the placenta, uh, but increasingly we understand that the decidual clock probably has more role to play. So the decidual clock, why do we think it's the decidua that is contributing? Because in a non-pregnant endometrium, the decidua has a pro-inflammatory response. And during pregnancy, the decidua becomes qu uh, quiet and there's dampening of the immune response in the decidua. And when uh, we reach term, this immune response uh, is uh, dampening, is reduced as withdrawal of the active suppression and there's an increase in the inflammatory signals which induce labor. So if these anti-inflammatory mechanisms are withdrawn early, and typically this happens with infection, then the decidua is metabolically dysregulated early, leading to preterm labor. So this entire cascade or the parturition cascade is what comes into play uh, and launching this little baby out of its comfort zone within the mother's womb but some of that is driven by the baby and its decision uh, to contribute to this process of labor. And finally, the last phase, which is uterine inter involution, is mediated entirely by oxytocin with the uterus shrinking back to its pre-pregnant state, which is uh, smaller than the size of our palm. And this happens very rapidly in the first week postpartum and gets completed by the sixth week. So if for any reason oxytocin does not work effectively to cause that quick clamping down of the uterus, then as you all know, that can result in significant postpartum hemorrhage, which is a leading cause of mortality. And we have newer drugs being produced in order to overcome that small that crisis which happens in a, a significant number of women. So I hope I have uh, discussed uh, and given you uh, some understanding of the complex interplay of uh, activity that results in uh, this beautiful miracle of a process called parturish. Thank you very much. Definitely, madam. Thank you so much. Actually, that was a quick summary, but very, uh, very essential points were covered. Because as we all know, like the definition of labor, yes, it is just in one line. It is the physiological process in which the baby comes out or expelled from the uterus. But the cascade of events that goes into that simple, just one process is uh, too much like if anything goes wrong in any of the steps that is when you have your complications so that was very well beautifully explained madam and especially the last slide I think the animation the comfort zone type that that was really nice so back thank to the so. basics reintegration of our basics thank you madam thank you so much uh, I think yeah okay. I, uh, I have the uh, may I have the privilege of introducing Dr. Richa Gupta, the next chairperson. Uh, Dr. Richa Gupta is a senior consultant, City Hospital Alwar. She is a president AOGS Alwar two, uh, 2021, secretary AOGS Alwar 2012 and 2017. She has got an experience of 22 years. A field of interest where, uh, are high-risk obstetrics and infertility. 
she has an active participation in various social welfare activities the, her awards are she received a public awareness award on women's day and best gynec uh, doctor award from ima alva she received a cervical uh, cancer awareness award from foxy in 2022 over to you madam for uh, chairing the next session hello hello yes ma'am you are audible thanks sir for giving me the opportunity to chair the session i introduce dr satya he is clinical director of cloud9 facility mm -hmm. trained in reproductive medicine at cmc vellore involving in teaching and training and post doctor fellow in reproductive medicine from 2005 and examiner for fnb and mrcoc exams and confirmed frcoc in 2019 over to you doctor yeah thank you thank you ma'am we'll be here share for now yes sorry for that delay uh thank you very much uh, for giving me this opportunity uh, to talk on the subject of embryo implantation basic sciences and clinical application so as we know the implantation of embryo has got three main steps apposition adhesion and invasion the embryo uh, at the blastocyst stage has to first hatch of autosis shell then it comes in physical contact uh, with the endometrium and that process is called apposition the second step when there's a molecular bonding between the embryo and the endometrium is called adhesion and the third part when the embryo actively invades into the luminal epithelium and thereafter into the stroma is called invasion so we can consider the embryo as a warrior and the endometrium as a fortress and this embryo has to make an assault on the endometrium to uh, reach into the stroma thereafter it has to modify the stromal cells and trick the mother's immune system to prevent a rejection so it's been found that the endometrium is refractory almost the entire cycle except a very small period called this the implantation window which lasts for a few hours to 3 days so at any other time even the world's best embryo cannot implant however if the luminal epithelium is damaged the implantation can happen even at other parts of the site so to repeat again the embryo is our warrior the luminal epithelium is a barricade of guards trying to prevent implantation there's a distinctive molecular signature of a receptive endometrium which is altered in women with recurrent implantation failure so if you see the genes that are active at the time of impl implantation you see inflammatory response alteration of the complement pathway wound repair responses immune responses and coagulation pathway responses so basically it's like the changes that we see in any injured part of our body so this implies that a weakened or an injured endometrium is a prerequisite for re receptivity so uh, how does this receptivity happen first you have the estradiol and progesterone priming that leads to a weakening of the endometrium or what we call as receptive endometrium the next level is the embryo has to send certain molecular signals which further cause weakening of the luminal epithelium so our warrior the embryo sends missiles and grenades in the form of extracellular vesicles and micro rna which go and hit the fortress of the endometrium and weaken it so what are these uh, embryonic extracellular vesicles they are membrane bound structures which carry and deliver lipids proteins dna 
and microRNA to other cells. And the microRNA is a non-coding RNA, which goes and binds to the mRNA of the endometrial epithelial cells and changes the gene expression, thereby making it more vulnerable to invasion by the embryo. So the targets of the microRNA are the luminal epithelial cells and the stromal cells. So by weakening or changing the gene expression of the luminal epithelial cells, addition and invasion are helped. If the microRNA profile is poor, then addition does not happen. So usually aneuploid embryos or chromosomally abnormal embryos will have defective uh, microRNA and therefore the endometrium doesn't allow implantation to happen in most of the cases. So we uh, come to apposition and adhesion. The embryo which is entered into the uterine cavity tries to identify the site of apposition, adhesion and invasion. It rolls around in the endometrial cavity, identifies weak points. This rolling over in the uterine lumen is affected by something called as a uterine glycocalyx. The microvilli in the uh, luminal epithelium is covered by glycocalyx and there are complementary receptors between the endometrium and uh, the embryo. One such thing is called L-selectin. This is there on the embryo and it has got corresponding oligosaccharide receptors in the endometrium. When the selectin and receptor complex binds, it helps the embryo to roll around in the endometrium, but the bonding is not strong enough to cause adhesion. So this helps the embryo to move around and find a place for itself to invade. There are other adhesion molecules. Some are pro-adhesion, some are anti-adhesions. So in this picture, you see this pink colored uh, uh, things, they are called MUSE1. They are anti-adhesion. So at the right side figure, you can see that at the site of implantation, those uh, MUSE1 have disappeared. So uh, one of the other markers of a receptive endometrium is reduction in the concentration of the MUSE1 receptors. The pro-adhesion receptors are alpha V beta 3 and also reduced expression of HOXA10 gene. So our embryo keeps trying at different places to find one that ultimately allows its docking to happen. There are also some mechanical forces at play. The embryo physically brushes off the glycocalyx using uh, trophoblastic enzymes called proteases to pave way for the anchorage. There are proteases which are released from the trophoblast and certain other uh, substances like lysophosphatidic acid. All these things also ultimately result in the final weakening of the epithelial barrier. So we first said that the estrogen and progesterone priming help to weaken the endometrium. Second was the microRNAs and EVs released from the embryo itself, which further led to a weakening of the endometrium. And finally, the proteases and LPA from the trophoblast, which help to weaken the endometrium. So now the endometrium is ready for the actual uh, invasion by the trophoblast. This breaching of the epithelium is uh, said to happen in 24 hours in mouse and we obviously don't have data for humans. So we've all heard of apoptosis, but in invasion, there's another process called entosis. Now, this is a cannibalism-like process in which healthy cells are eaten up by another cell without apoptosis and necrosis. These trophoblast cells also can intrude in between epithelial cells or fuse with the epithelial cells and thereafter enter into the stroma. So in this picture on the left side, you see uh, one of the embryo cells is eating up the luminal epithelial cells. Whereas on the other side, you can see the embryos are trying to squeeze in between luminal epithelial cells to enter into the stroma. The other very important event that has to happen during implantation is called decidualization. And once the embryo breaches the luminal epithelium, the uterus transforms into the decidua. So certain secretory changes happen in the stroma. There's an influx of uterine natural killer cells, the exclusion of maternal T and B lymphocytes and certain vascular changes. And this change, this decidualization is a prerequisite for implantation. 
So on the left side of the image, again, you see those splenital cells characteristic of a pre-decidualized pre-decidual endometrium. On the right-hand side, you find decidualized epithelium, I mean the stroma, which is a prerequisite for uh, implantation. So uh, during decidualization, the stromal cells undergo epi epigenetic transformation or methylation, and they become secretory in nature. Such dramatic changes are not seen anywhere else in the body. Also about the immune system that uh, changes in the uterus, the pregnant uterus has got a dampened immunological repertoire. There's a resistance uh, of inflammatory and oxidative insults caused by the embryo. The natural killer cells, which are normally harmful to the MHC null cell like the trophoblast, become somehow less cytotoxic. The number of maternal T cells and B cells are kept to a minimum to prevent fetal reduction, uh, rejection. So we see that the blastocyst is semi allogenic but still it's not rejected because the uterine natural killer cell becomes a decidual natural killer cell, which is less cytotoxic. And the decidual stroma undergoes certain epigenetic changes, which prevents the lymphocytes from homing in near the trophoblast and thus protecting the embryo from damage. So uh, if you say to summarize the uh, physiological processes that happen, the first thing that happens is there is an endowment of receptivity in the endometrium. Second is the blastocyst attacks the fort by its armamentarium of microRNA and EVs. And finally, the embryo invades into the uh, luminal epithelium. In this war between the uh, lone embryo and the fortress of endometrium, the results mostly favor the endometrium as the rate of natural conception is less than 30% and not very high in, even in ART. Thus, not to achieve a pregnancy appears to be a default process. Why is it so? So it's speculated that in this clash, the ultimate aim is to desire a healthy heir. Only the fittest should survive. Now, what happens if either the embryo or the endometrium is weak? If you have a genetically weak embryo, the signals it sends to the endometrium would also be weak. And so the endometrium will not lower its, uh, its uh, or rather it will be less vulnerable to invasion and therefore there's a termination of receptivity. However, if it's a weak endometrium, it is over receptive, even uh, aneuploid embryos get implanted and thereby leading on to recurrent pregnancy loss. And in the third scenario, when there's no clear cut victory between the embryo and the endometrium, there is suboptimal decidualization, shallow placentation leading on to preeclampsia or IUGR. So a lot about implantation is still unknown. But uh, how can we apply this knowledge in clinical practice? How do we select an optimal embryo? How can we assist the embryo to attach or invade? And can we identify the uterus uh, which is most receptive? So generally the conventional practice is to grade the embryo by its appearance. And uh, so an expanded blastocyst or a hatching blastocyst is considered to be the top blastocyst. But even if you transfer two top quality blastocysts, the implantation rate is around 40%. If you were to transfer a single top quality blastocyst, the implantation is around 30%. This implies that most good looking embryos fail to implant. Why is it so? So if you look at this data, you'll find that of transferring two blastocysts the implantation rate is around 40.44%. Also, another factor is if you are having a morphologically variant eggs, that is abnormal looking eggs will lo have lower fertilization, lower chance of implantation. So if you see uh, column one, you have normal looking oocytes, there the live birth rate is around 48.5%. Those where there's a combination of normal eggs plus morphologically variant oocytes, is 38.8%. And we, when you have only morphologically variant oocytes, the implantation rates is as low as 17.8%. So the embryo grade is important. The embryo, uh, the egg quality is also important. And most important is, is the embryo chromosomally normal or not? 
there was a very elegant study done uh, with where they found that when three consecutive single embryo transfer of chromosomally normal embryos was done a pregnancy rate per patient of 90% was obtained which shows how important the embryo is vis-a-vis -vis the endometrium when we stratified for age so about for 35 years they found that this uh, pregnancy rate was 90% and for 42 years it's like 73% that means even if you put a chromosomally normal embryo as a woman ages there are other factors which lead to a reduction uh, in implantation now so should we test all embryos uh, especially for older women before transferring so as to transfer only chromosomally normal embryos this is a controversial subject uh, initial studies showed that there's a higher probability of live birth in women above 35 if we transfer tested embryos the drawback is with older women we have fewer eggs fewer embryos and most of them would be aneuploid so this would require multiple cycles to be done also some embryos have a mosaic pattern that is some cells are normal some are abnormal so the, there's a confusion whether to transfer a mosaic embryo or not so the current thought is that low order mosaics can be transferred also uh, some recent studies have shown that more than 38 years female age if you are able to do a pre implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy that would increase the live birth rate per embryo transfer the cumulative pregnancy rate however does not change also when we go for ivf we have very high levels of estrogen in the body and that leads to uh, and also progesterone which leads to uh, asynchrony between the endometrium and the embryo so there was a uh, in 2011 there was a whole new thought that we should not be doing fresh embryo transfer at all we should do only elective uh, frozen embryo transfer they said that if you did fresh transfer there was a 64.7% um, reduction in implantation and they said that if the asynchrony was more than 3 days between the embryo and the endometrium that would lead to a reduced implantation however a recent Cochrane review says that there's little or no difference in cumulative live birth rate between fresh and frozen cycles the advantage of a frozen cycle is the less risk of hyperstimulation but the disadvantage of frozen embryo transfer is a higher risk of pih large for date babies and a recent study showed an increased risk of childhood cancer in babies born after frozen embryo transfer also there's something called embryo glue which is basically hyaluronic acid does it really work uh, according to a cochrane review there is moderate quality evidence that it does uh, increase live birth and there's a slight decrease in miscarriage rates uh, now how useful is this window of implantation for embryo transfer a very recent study says that it really is not very important when you transfer blastocyst after 3 4 5 6 or 7 days of progesterone the pregnancy rates are more or less the same so this totally uh, uh, takes off the endometrial receptivity concept or a window of implantation concept we don't know how good the study is because we have, don't have access to the full text so there is this concept of endometrial receptivity mapping where you to try to identify which day of the cycle the woman's uterus is most receptive and this has been recommended uh, again for the last 10 years by a group in spain um, and they say that in recurrent implantation failure if you were to do this the pregnancy rates would rise from 15 to 50% so this study also showed a benefit of this endometrial receptivity mapping however there are other studies which totally go to the opposite end of the spectrum and say that doing the endometrial receptivity assay has no benefit uh, in either self cycles or in donor cycles so to conclude the embryo appears to be the most important factor in implantation the embryo euploidy is the major determinant for pregnancy but currently the methods are invasive so non invasive methods need to be standardized the endometrial receptivity mapping shows conflicting reports in literature however greater understanding of this process is needed and effective methods to identify immune causes of implantation failure and appropriate treatment strategies are needed thank you very much
it was thank very, you dr satya it was a very nice session and uh, you taught very good uh, about uh, endometrium receptivity and how this knowledge can be helpful in uh, our infertility practice and in art clinics thank you very much thank you much thank you sir dr satya sir you have made a, such a complicated topic into a very simple and understandable and uh, it was uh, it was a wonderful session sir i request uh, dr sunita ma'am uh, uh, to introduce dr jairani ma'am for the next session on sexual dysfunction So, shall I take put the slide of the CV? Yeah. Uh, Doctor Vichya, ma'am, can you introduce? Hello. Yeah. 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 As Doctor Jarani, uh, our uh, star of this CME needs no introduction, but uh, as a formality, uh, she is senior consultant of reproductive medicine, infertility, and sexual medicine. uh in uh, akash fertility center and hospital chennai president of ogssi trezar and associate secretary of world association for sexual health advisory committee joint organizing secretary of isar 2015 and uh, member of foxy american society for reproductive medicine and uh, she has got many more awards and now i welcome dr jarani for uh, her next session thank you dr richa thank you for the introduction and uh, i thank my oxy endocrinology committee for organizing this wonderful uh, webinar on the basic physiological aspects of uh, the various activities of the human sexuality that's what i would put into it because it includes the ovulation parturition sexual act and everything can you see my presentation yes ma'am yes ma'am so today i'm going to talk about something very different and interesting so we all know sex is a word which is talked which is tabooed which is myth which says says an abuse or which we say as a, a, a complex and many words comes for the simple word but it has been a talk in many aspects of life so do you think sex sex is such a simple word no it's not that simple it forms the basis of a sexuality of the human as a whole so this great persons masters and virgin john virginia johnson both have made a great effort in getting into the basis of the sexual physiology they made a lot of human experiments and a very very interesting history they made in the history of sexual medicine where they formulated the first human response sexual response which is a very important component of the sexual act so that has been depicted in their original writing in 1966 the sexual response cycle which is a four phase model which includes an excitement plateau orgasm and resolution which they have made this uh, model for the sexual response cycle the two basic physiological response what comes into this sexual act or two things one is the vascular that's the vaso congestion which in the male it causes a penile erection and for the female it is a clitoral erection and turgidity and stimulations with the engorgement of the breast and next component is the muscular where there is a flexion and contraction of the muscles either in the genital of the men or in the vagina of the female so this is the main component or the basic physiological responses which we see in a sexual act so that has been very nicely depicted in the sexual response cycle so for a man this is the usual and the typical response cycle but when you look into the women which is little more complex which has a excitement plateau and even a multiple orgasm and even a resolution very very much differentiating from the men into the women so women make this sexual response still more complex 
all the more this is a very complex one and of it make this is still more a very complex one so we all know the normal sexual arousal and response which is supposed to be an integrated process which is in which involves a physiological and a psychological process the current understanding of the sexual arousal does not provide a coherent model that accounts for the integration of the multiple physiological systems that subsequently generated a coordinated sexual response both at the spinal peripheral and in the central levels so what are the physiological factors which contributes to the sexual response when you look at the physiological factors because psychological factors we know that comes into a very big list which could be many things like an anxiety your stress your social your surrounding everything play a role but when you look at the physiological factors which are the very important contributing factors for the sexual response which is the main being be the pituitary gonadal axis and its peptide in the steroidal secretions of the pituitary gonadal axis and next is the sensi sensio motor neuronal pathways that includes the somatic and the autonomic components and third is the autonomic activity that includes both parasympathetic and the sympathetic response which is seen and fourth one is the spinal and the cerebral circuits it is made through this connectivity for the response integration and control and last is the neurochemical transmitters and modulators which modulates this activity so it is made of so many physiological factors which mainly contribute to the basic sexual response which starts as an arousal and then it's causing an excitement so this is the basics of a beginning of a sexual response so added to this complex complexity is the fact that each of these various factor may play a different role in each of the various components of the sexual response cycle and each may be contributing in a different way to sexual response in men and women and it is a very important one and all the more this complex integrative nature of the sexual response in which the central and the peripheral physiological mechanism can account more for the phenomenological experience associated with the sexual experiences such as lust passion excitement climax and satisfaction which also always re remain somewhat elusive so all these things make this a complex component of the sexual activity so let's look into the what are the endocrinological basis of the sexual arousability the sexual arousal is the first starting of the sexual response cycle what are the basic of the endocrines which play a role in this sexual arousability we know the gonadal hormones the estrogen and the androgens in they in the human they play a very important subtle role which is undisputable and makes a complex role probably through this asymmetric asymmetric across sexes which differentiate between the men and the women and estrogen and androgens work synergistically to enhance sexual arousal and response both in the male and the female that's what very interestingly they found out in the research with respect to estrogen a number of studies report higher libido in women during the follicular phase because we all know estrogen is a women hormone and during the follicular phase when there is a higher libido which is observed in the women and the ovulatory phase of the menstrual cycle which declines abruptly after thereafter suggesting the role of the estrogens in the follicular phase and thereafter which induces the lh secretion and that's the ovulation in mediating the sexual desire which is almost encountered in the follicular phase so that is the main important basis of estrogen which has been proved without doubt have an effect on the sexual desire which is almost seen in the phase of the follicular phase where the fs your estrogen is at the higher level how it acts in the female the androgens so we all know for any desire uh, androgen is also very important in a women when there is no androgen the estrogen cannot act that's what the basis says this has been proved by many studies what they found out is androgen secreted they are both by the ovaries and the adrenal glands but in women a deficiency at any age uh, by the adrenal glands leads to complaints of the sexual or loss of sexual function for example in a premenopausal women who has a regular menstrual cycle who has a normal level of estrogen and progesterone but she suffers a decreased androgen levels from the adrenal dysfunction she usually presents with a low desire a condition that can be reversed 
by supplementation with the androgens. That has been proved, proved in the studies by the guy. They have conducted two years of study where they have found out supplementation of androgen in a woman with the androgen depletion improves her sexual function. Still more, in naturally and surgically menopausal women, in a menopausal women, administration of estrogen alone will not clear her problem. But you have to add on a testosterone which provides a greater improvement in the psychological as well as the physiological activities of all the losses which she encountered in the menopause like lack of concentration, depression and fatigue and sexual symptoms like lowered libido, less sexual arousal and less ability to have orgasm which can be improved by supplementation with the testosterone than when they are treated with estrogen alone. That has been the study conducted by Davis in 1998. They have proved beyond doubt supplementation of androgen is very essential along with estrogen it will help in the improvement of the psychological component. And third, they have studied that in postmenopausal women, the administration of an androgen precursor by itself can significantly increase the most aspects of libido with the drug having an effect in increasing both testosterone and the estradiol levels. So in the main, sexual libido and arousal have long been associated with the presence and use of androgens and its role has been well documented but in women, estrogen along with androgen also play a role. So now comes a very important question. How does androgen and estrogen play a role? Because we know different, definitely these are two antagonizing hormone. One is a female hormone and it's a male hormone. Does they have anything proportionate to look into the physiology? That comes a very important aspect of defining an androgen-estrogen ratio and its role in this sexual act. So we know that both androgen and estrogen appear to be important in sexual arousal, both the response in the both in the men and the women. But if you look into the depth in women and men, the highest level of sexual arousability is associated with the concomitant action of two antagonistic classes of sexual hormones, that is the androgens and estrogens. The relative ratio of these classes of hormones may be critically important with a strong and weak combination being most effective. Because there is a balance that is a very important one. In men, the androgen is the dominant and in the women, the estrogen. But they also need a balance. That has been proved very clearly. In men, the effective balance normally consists of strong androgen stimulation and a weak estrogenic stimulation. Whereas in a women, the effective balance typically consists of strong estrogenic stimulation and a weak androgenic stimulation. So, that is the very important aspect of the neuroendocrine asymmetry and its autonomic activation as described in the studies. In both men and women, the sexual arousability seemed to be highest when both the set of hormones like androgen and estrogen are functional. That's very important. They should be functional. With these set of hormones acting synergistically on parasympathetic and the sympathetic centers. That's why if androgen and estrogens were present with equal effectiveness, or in equal amounts, like either the, the women or um, women have a low androgen and low estrogen, or high androgen and high estrogen, then the hormones would have a synergistic effect. Like it may increase the libido both together, or they decrease the libido both together because of its symmetric effect on the autonomic centers. But that is why the both the components of the autonomic system should be equally stimulated both by the, it's a very, very controversial, I mean, contradictory one, both the parasympathetic as the sympathetic would be equally stimulated. So in this way, a neuroendocrine asymmetry and an automatic autonomic activation is implied in the sexual act. There, what they found out is when combined in the more natural high and low ratio, this asymmetric hormonal balance of androgen and estrogen would induce asymmetric sympathetic and parasympathetic effect. This perhaps being the more functional relationship between the two autonomic components. In other words, the sexual arousal is likely to be greatest, not just when both sympathetic and parasympathetic system are activated, but when they are activated to a different degrees. That is what. There should be an asymmetry between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic activity which is mainly underlying by the levels of the hormones. So the endocrines play a very important role in the balancing that in a man, the androgen is higher and the estrogen is lower. 
thereby there is an asymmetry between the endocrine which creates that asymmetry in the sympathetic and the parasympathetic system being activated in an asymmetric way thereby their activity is differing and thereby the effectiveness in the way of the expression of the sexual act has been experimented so that is what is given in this slide if you look into it in a women in a men how it acts the androgen has a strong parasympathetic stimulation whereas the the estrogen has a negative or a negativity so there is an imbalance in this activity and if you look into the uh, women the opponent happens the androgens are very weak creating a low autonomic impulse whereas the estrogen has an increased potential sympathetic activity so they all act in the common autonomic center but they have a different input depending on the hormones so the endocrine system forms a very important basis in this way so the sexual hormones play a very important role in sexual arousal by ensuring cer cerebral integration between the somatic and the autonomic sexual systems in this way the sexual hormones could contribute to the extent of the spinal sexual reflexes to the cerebral level and consequently to the erogenization of the genital stimulation via the activation of the autonomic centers so there is a balance of the androgens and estrogens in a strong weak combination which provides the most effective means of maintaining the sexual arousal with each class of hormones acting on a different autonomic axis in the human that is in the men and the women so how this arousal ends in the human sexual behavior so when you look into the neurobiology of the sexual responses both in the male and the female it relies on four important system the one which we saw is the neuroendocrine the next is the limbic which is in the cortical level and autonomic it is in the spinal level and in the somatic in the visceral level so these are all the four important systems which play a very important role in the biology of the sexual response let's in look into the reality what happens during the sexual responses so at the level of the spinal cord the somatic and the visceral afferents and efferents come together because the stimulation comes from the perineum from the sexual genital organs it go to the uh, spinal cord and from there there that the spinal cord receives all the somatic and the visceral afferents and sends its efferents which also come through the same center which leads to a reflex or which leads to a sexual responses so the male this includes erection emission ejaculation and orgasm whereas in a women this include the sexual response include vaginal lubrication engagement of the erectile tissue especially the clitoris and the components leading on to orgasm the sexual response in this way is dependent on both the somatic as well as the visceral nervous system the nerve which is being effective in this is the pudendal nerve which is in the s2 s4 level carries the somatic innervation to the perineum including the genitalia the sensory information from the er erogenous areas of the perineum mainly around the g spot that is the clitoris it is carried by the pudendal nerve and this is a voluntary motor information to the pelvic floor through the muscles which causes the orgasm thereby it leads to a rhythmic contraction on the lower part of the vagina which ends in an orgasm or a ejaculation in the male so the visceral nervous system which innervates the blood vessels of the glands and also all the organs of the genital area is responsible for the erection as well as uh, erection in the men and the vaginal lubrication in the women and also important as the emission and the ejaculation in the male and also the components of muscular contraction of the lower vagina is in women which ends in a uh, orgasm so these are all the very important thing that you should understand the role which is played by the pudendal nerve which is the parasympathetic fibers which acts mainly causing the erection in the men and also which is very important in the effect of the women both in the parasympathetic causing the vaginal lubrication and engorgement of the uh, erectile tissue in the women which is mediated by the parasympathetic nervous system so that is the uh, diagrammatic representation of the limbic system the cortico medullary system which leads to arousal and that localizes the spinal center that is the t2 l1 and which 
through the afferent from the genital area, either in the form of a sensory or in a erotic zones, it causes an efference. And from there, they are connected either directly through the cortex or through the spinal center. And the efferent comes as, as an erection as well as an ejaculation causing the muscular contraction. So that is the pathway of the system. So when you look into really what happens during the various sexual response cycle in the women, when you look into the during the excitement phase, there is a vaginal lubrication and the inner two-third two of the vagina expands. The labia majora gets flattened and move apart and the labia minora and the clitoris engorge and gets enlarged. And there is a contraction of the smooth muscles, especially the small muscles or fibers in the breast and especially in the nipples. So this is the excitement phase in a women, which is very, the, what, what they found out is the speed of the response, which is very slower during the excitement phase. And response to the touch and the physical stimuli is very slow. And that leads to a vaginal lubrication. But in the men, the excitement phase is very faster. And they have a lot of visual stimuli, which plays a very important role, which ends in a penile erection. And next, next come to the plateau. After the excitement, there's a plateau. What happens during the plateau in the women is the prominent vasocongestion, which seen in the lower two-thirds of the vagina, which makes the vaginal walls to swell because of the engorgement of the, all the vascular, uh, uh, I mean, uh, vessels around the vagina, which causes a engorgement of the lower vagina as well as the genital system, where the clitoris gets retracted and the labia minora increases in the color and the bright color, it gets into a reddening color because of the vasocongestion. And the clitoris is pulled back against the pubic bone, just like it's an erection of the male penis. And then it ends in a orgasm where there's a contraction of the lower two-third of the vaginal mus muscle which leads to a orgasmic rhythmic contraction uh, around the uh, rectal sphincter and thereby there is a improvement or it, it, it enhances the orgasm in the women. So what are the main sympathetic I mean, uh, neural role that is played is the first is the orgasm it is mainly the sympathetic where the sympathetic center overacts that causes a more variability in women. That is why many women go through multiple orgasms. And in the resolution phase, it comes to the baseline, which is very slower in women, but it becomes faster in the men. And the refractory phase is the phase which is always seen in a man where they cannot have a repeat orgasm. But in a women, there are repeated orgasm has been proved. So that is the resolution phase which happens in a women where the uterus drops back because it gets tightened, it gets contracting. And the vagina gets droops and the cervical, uh, I mean, drooping of the cervix into the seminal fluid. If there is an ejaculation, there's a seminal fluid. This is a very important step. That is why there is an increased entry of the semen at this time because the cervix exactly droops into the seminal pool once the orgasm platform resolves. So that is the diagrammatic representation. So, so the various hormones which play a role in this human response cycle, if you look into the desire and libido, the dopamine has a stimulatory effect, whereas the serotonin has an inhibitory effect and the testosterone in a threshold level helps to maintain both the things in the proper level. And in the excitement and arousal phase, the parasympathetic play a very important role and has a difference in both the gender. In the women, it, can, it increases the arousal Whereas in the male, it contains more of a erection. And in the plateau phase, the parasympathetic is more in a man and it is less in a woman. That's why the plateau is prolonged in a woman. And if you look into the various hormones which play a role in the desire, the dopamine causes stimulation, serotonin inhibition and testosterone threshold and excitement. We know the para parasympathetic causes engorgement. And in the plateau, the parasympathetic Engorgement, intensification and excitement happens. And in orgasm, the sympathetic plays a very important role and it has a variability response in a women causing multiple orgasms. And the resolution is faster in a men and slower in a women. And in refractory phase, this occurs only in, it, it is a period of inability where there is no repeat orgasm, which is always seen in men and it always varies with the age also. So with this word, I thank you one and all for the patient listening. And I think I have clinically, I've summarized something regarding the sexual uh, health or the sexual act because I don't want to go into the depth of it. 
because as a basis we should know how the endocrine system and the neuro endocrinology plays a role in the sexual act that is what i've given as a uh, interesting way to explain everything thank you so much over to you mohana and the way you explained it shows how depth in the knowledge you have in this uh, sexual thing so uh, i thought it's a very difficult thing uh, to understand and you made it simple and easy and uh, really i got interested towards this uh, sexual medicine madam now was you made it so well and this explaining the endocrine the neuroendocrine part and the arousal the various stages of a sexual uh, uh, act this is very very this is a crystal clear presentation madam thank you so much for that thank you mona thank you thank you and uh, audience uh, uh, if you have any questions ma'am uh, chat box i could see some questions ma'am um kundavi she has asked about role of testosterone deficiency in replacement in men with infertility so the role of testosterone is only i think uh, we all know it is only in a hypogonadotropic gonadism where the testosterone plays a very important role it should not be given for any other condition because it has a negative feedback on the uh, i mean uh, sperm production so it is only indicated when there is a hypogonadotropic gonadism and should we do testosterone level before giving to women there are some studies which states that the testosterone level has to be checked but in post menopausal women the only approved canadian canadian society alone have approved supplementation of testosterone for the uh, uh, hypoactive desire disorder in the form of a testosterone patches and testosterone uh, pills but fda hasn't approved it but there are some studies which shows that there is an improvement in the sexual function with testosterone uh, patches that has been given 300 micrograms of testosterone patches is very beneficial in improving the hypoactive desire disorder in women yes dhas yes they are there are uh, it, it because we all know testosterone is metabolized into uh, it's the the active component is uh, it's it's due to, it's uh, the the metabolism of testosterone is very fast but when it transform to dihydrotestosterone it is slowly get diluted so dihydrotestosterone has more potential effect on the testosterone level so dha has a very important role in supplementing very similar to dhd and thereby it helps to improve the androgen level especially in the postmenopausal women with uh, with who have a low desire and hypoactive desire disorders this is very proved improvement in their uh, desire has been proved without doubt tibolon tibolon yes it is a uh, the studies there are not much of a studies with tibolon it's used in uh, hypoactive desire disorder but it has been proved as one of the drugs which has been prescribed for hypoactive desire disorder especially in post menopausal women who are contraindicated with hrt the tibolon can be of useful for hypoactive desire disorder it improves it has uh, anti estrogenic as well as but it has the pro uh, androgenic effect that is very helpful in a role in the tibolon what is the role for uh, sildenafil madam vaginal sildenafil sildenafil uh. will cause only it improves the blood flow because it causes a vasodilatation it acts through the nitric oxide receptors so thereby it causes a Uh, vaso dilatation and vaso congestion and thereby it improves the vascularity and thereby it helps to improve the vaginal lubrication and the vaso dilatation effect it doesn't there have been studies which prove that they don't have any effect on the sexual stimulation but the improved blood flow will cause an improved in the sensory approval appraisal see even when you put an estrogen cream that has only an effect of improving the uh atrophied layer can be improved the the lining uh, layer which gets atrophied can improve but the sensory stimulation has to be improved by the vaso vascular phenomena that is brought about by uh, sildenafil so sildenafil only acts through vaso dilatation what is the ideal treatment for the perimenopausal lady with loss of libido madam uh, how to improve their uh, desire see the desire hypoactive desire disorder is a big entity 
we have to find out what is the real basis in her the usual commonest problem is mainly the atrophy the vaginal local atrophy which makes her go for a painful sex and that itself will make her i mean averse for the sexual act but in a perimenopausal women who have a low estrogen level and have a low desire first thing we have to rule out is the psychological problems next is the relationship problem and third is the local problem because of the hormones so properly ideally the only fda approved drug is the flibanserin which is the adis we call and nowadays one more drug is the bupropionate which is a vesli which is also approved by fda both the drugs act on the cortical level and improves the uh, cognitive improvement in the women and thereby that improves a desire in the women but we should be very careful because they create a lot of nausea vomiting and changes in the blood pressure and so they are not uh, indicated in women with hypertension and they should be given very properly very carefully because there are incidences which shows a lot of uh, uh, i mean uh, hyper i mean be blood pressure i mean a hypertensive crisis can happen so we should be given with carefulness and it can't be repeated or it can't be taken with along with the uh, alcoholic drinks also that also is contraindicated with uh, your flibanserin so it should be given in a proper manner thank you ma'am there we if there is no uh, i think there is no further questions uh, uh, we... one more question is yes. high serum yesterday also during stimulation okay this has been answered by uh, i think rakhi has answered this yeah i think they have answered the questions and on i think if there yes, are no questions we can yes we can wind up yeah. yes ma'am Yes, ma'am. So, thank you, uh, ma'am. Thank you, Oxy, and uh, our uh, beloved uh, president, Dr. Jairani, ma'am, and uh, our secretary, Dr. Kundavi, ma'am, for giving us such a wonderful opportunity to organize this session. And hope uh, it would have been uh, useful for me, uh, useful to many, because uh, we have covered uh, the physiology, that is, endocrinology of all uh, this ovulation, parturition, and implantation, and the sexual health. and i thank uh, from bottom of my heart uh, the uh, guest of honor and the chief guest for uh, uh, participating and encouraging us and uh, the chairperson um, uh, dr sunita ma'am dr billow and dr shyama and dr richa gupta ma'am for uh, participating and encouraging us and i thank uh, the shield connect for the logistics and uh,